This talk is security for humans. Because I'm a security engineer, I'm actually not very good with humans, so I think this is what a human looks like, but I'm not really sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about privacy and coercion-resistant design, um, and I'm going to talk about a bunch of other stuff as well. When I actually say privacy, I'm actually going to be using this in an exceptionally generalized term, which, which, which largely relates to a type of agreement that you have with people and how you handle their data. Um, I, I don't particularly want to get into the weeds on that, although I, I do like these sorts of conversations and will be happy to have it at the bar at the Doubletree later. Um, so, as you mentioned, my name is Morgan Marquibois. I work for a variety of organizations. I split my time these days largely between uh, s security, human rights research, and, and journalism. Uh, my day job is being the director of security at First Look Media, who I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Um, I used to be a penetration tester. I had maybe four or five years where I had a lot of fun breaking into power plants and water sanitation facilities and banks and airlines and that sort of thing. I spent six years at Google Security uh, being a security engineer, and I'm very enthused about the fact that I was one of the founders of the KiwiCon conference in New Zealand, so you guys should all go. Um, so First Look Media is a kind of an interesting new media enterprise, endeavor. Uh, you probably haven't heard that name, but you've probably heard of these two people. Uh, one of them is Laura Poitras, who just won an Oscar for Citizen Four, and the other one is Glenn Greenwald. Um, these are two of the journalists who, together with Barton Gilman, were given documents by this man, uh, Edward Snowden. Um, yeah, I, I think he's pretty cool, too. Um, and um, yeah, so that they were given a trove of, 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 of toxic documents pertaining to the activities of the, the GCHQ and the NSA. Um, so in my day job, I have to sort of look after a bunch of unruly journalists. And <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've been doing for the last 18 months, but probably in vagaries for reasons that you'll understand. Um, I also do a bunch of research and have done for years with the Citizen Lab out of the University of Toronto. Uh, and they are very interested in the sort of intersection of digital media, global security, and human rights. Uh, I also advise Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and that type of things of the sort of the, the potential human rights impact of emergent technologies and, and security and so forth. Uh, so what am I talking about today? Well, I really wanted to talk about coercion-resistant design uh, because this particular crowd is actually really good at uh, systems thinking, resilience in big systems, failure modes in big systems. Um, and in fact, the previous talk was fantastic, a great example of that, and it was also really funny, so I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, but I think this crowd thinks about system failure and system resilience in a very specific way. Um, and I've been thinking about this problem for a really long time in a slightly different way. Uh, so I have to start with an admission. Um, so I was, <laughs> I was one of those kids who, who was really, really into the internet. I thought, I thought that the internet would just save the world. So I mean, because I, I actually got to see it kind of happen, right? Um, so, so bear in mind that, like, you know, I, I'm an academic brat, and so, you know, my first experience with the internet was when my parents got email at the universities and would use these text clients to be able to, like, you know, send emails to sort of other academics around the world. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, got, I remember getting it at home and thinking that this, this amazing piece of technology would actually enable, you know, untold and unprecedented freedom of expression, which would naturally be sort of a liberation technology and issue in this, you know, global era of peace and goodwill towards everybody. Um, which isn't entirely what happened, you know, but it, it was a kind of a 90s dream, you know, um, and it, it still lives on in a little part of my heart. I mean, I, I try to keep that fire alive, because of course what we got was a little bit more like this, um, which is sort of unfortunate, right? And I think what happened was that much like a lot of technology, early on it sort of benefited the early adopter, right? The fast, the nimble, the hobbyist. Um, and you're like, oh my god, this is really cool, we can do all these things with it. But, you, you know, as, as you guys will be aware, technology is a power amplifier. Uh, and, and that means, of course, when forces of institutional power, you know, really got hold of the internet, they were like, oh, yeah, we can do all sorts of interesting things with this. Um, so, I'm going to talk about coercion-resistant design and, and sort of designing for the inevitability of, of what will happen to 
sort of the success of your endeavor. But I did this thing earlier where yesterday and today, I've actually been talking to attendees, and I said, you know, what, what would you like me to talk about if I was going to talk about anything you wanted? Like, assume just one time only I'm a jukebox and I'll take requests. And I had people ask, say all sorts of things. It's like, oh, I mean, I'd like you to talk about you know, the targeted activists. I'd love you to talk about human rights work. I'd love you to talk about nation-state malware, and I'd love you to talk about surveillance or Snowden or all these types of things. Um, and then I actually realized that a, a lot of these <laughs> were questions I'd sort of had before and spoke to like really human problems that actually really frustrated me because occasionally can be a really impatient guy. Um, but so what I'm going to do actually is talk a little bit about threat modeling um, and sort of a taxonomy of attackers and actors that kind of inhabit my world that I've studied over the last, you know, six to ten years or something. Um, and a lot of these cases have involved very real people. And I'm sort of going to talk about this and then, I guess, about how we can try to design against these problems. Um, so this isn't my usual crowd, so I want to ask some questions. Everybody here knows what, you know, exploits are? Can, we, can I get a show of hands? This is good, like, if I talk, start talking about memory corruption and heap sprays, sort of, maybe, yeah, okay, this is great, we're going to get on good. Um, right, so I worked at Google for six years, and I was on the team at Google who did incident response, forensics, and malware analysis when we were hacked by China. Um, and this was sort of an interesting time. This is sort of back in late, late 2009, early 2010. Um, and, and what happened was that this kind of led to a lot of, a lot of chest beating, you know. It was kind of like, oh, shame on you, China. How could you hack Google? You know, this is, this is really bad. Um, and then, of course, we discovered that China hadn't just hacked Google. China had hacked lots of Silicon Valley and all sorts of other things beside. And then as things... <laughs> progressed on, we discovered that it wasn't just China, but that actually that, that all the nation states were hacking pretty much everything all the time. In fact, if you had interesting data, the question isn't if someone will come for it, it's how many people will come for it. Um, and it's not actually all nation states. All nation states kind of wish they were. It's generally, it's heavily weighted towards people that have, you know, universities with comp sci programs and maths, progr you know, maths programs and so forth, as you might imagine. And so this takes us back sort of six years. Um, and I, I was working doing incident response and forensics, and then, you know, there was this kind of uh, wave of revolutionary activity across the Arab world. And, you know, I've been watching it on the news, like many people, and I had friends called freedom botherers, you know, do-gooders, those sort of people, and they, they ended up messaging me and saying, hey, Morgan, you know, we think we're seeing malware that's actually sort of targeting, you know, activists, human rights researchers, and sort of journalists in, in Syria. This sounds like your sort of thing. And I was like, yeah, okay. Uh, and they're like, could, could you have a look at it for us? And so I started analyzing this malware as it came in. And, and some of this was actually pretty grim. This, this guy's name is Taimo Karim. Um, and... He was arrested by the, the Syrian authorities. Uh, he was tortured. Um, he, he says he thought he would never see daylight again, but, but the thing he said that really stuck with me was, my computer was arrested before I was. And they had transcripts of, of all his Skype chats that, that enumerated all the people that he was talking to on his computer. They'd been logging his keystrokes, looking at his emails, that type of thing. Um, and I spent years like literally years, um, tracking these sort of operations in Syria. Um, the guy's face you see there, his name is Buran Galyun. For, for a while, he was the head of the Syrian transnational opposition. Uh, he's also a lecturer at the University of the Sorbonne in Paris. Um, I mean, there were things that they would do, like they, the, they hacked his Facebook page. And, and by they, you know, there's a kind of, you know, in, in my end of the woods, attribution is tricky. And so I, I would generally use the term uh, pro-Syrian government actors, perhaps, um, you know, sort of a nation-state sponsored hacking attempts. You know, sort of his Facebook was compromised and, and uh, links to, to malware were spread through his Facebook to sort of, you know, various interesting 
uh, followers and associates of his. And I mean, th this is just an example. As I said, this, this sort of campaign continued for years and actually sort of continues to the current day. Um, I, I published a variety of maybe like 13 or 14 pieces on this with the EFF and with Citizen Lab. Um, and in late 2012, I was contacted by Bahrain Watch. And, and this is a group that monitors the sale of arms internationally to Bahrain. It is not very popular with the Bahrain government. Um, this woman's name is Alasha Shahabi. Um, she is one of the co-founders of Bahrain Watch. And she is what I now call Fin Fisher Patient Zero. And I'm not sure how much you guys actually know about this scene, but as the desire for internet surveillance capability has increased with the move of people towards using the internet as sort of like a default digital commons for our world, uh, there's been a booming commercial market for offensive software. Um, FinFisher was one of the first companies to come to light as, as providing this stuff commercially. They're, they're a company based out of Munich. Um, and what happened was during the Arab Spring, the, in, in Egypt, the doors of the state surveillance secret police were, were kicked down and ransacked. And people found all of these documents regarding the sale of this software, and then these were published. And so, so this kind of gained notoriety, but no one had actually ever seen the software. And you know, if you worked in the security scene, it was actually very interesting to me, because typically, you know, if you guys remember back to 92, 93, right, when the sort of the birth of the virus scene, and you've got John McAfee screaming that the Michelangelo virus is going to destroy the internet, and then sort of nothing happens. And then you've got someone else screaming that the Melissa virus is going to destroy the internet, and then like, nothing happens. Um, <laughs> and so I was actually very, very interested in what commercial malware actually written by you know, that they have an office, you know where it is, there's a large group of people, they have a, you know, a group of employees uh, that they you know, presumably pay reasonably. I was very interested in what this looked like. And she was actually the first person that was ever found to be targeted by it. Um, and so I helped her analyze it, it was actually pretty interesting. I mean, they, they used this sort of interesting polymorphic packer with like, you know, seven or eight different code templates to sort of obfuscate and, you know, sort of frustrate someone trying to do reverse engineering of the code. Um, I mean, it was all right. It costs like, I think it costs like 300,000 euros, so that's, that's how much it costs for this sort of thing. Um, don't get any ideas, I would be really pissed if that was the takeaway of this talk. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so I mean, after I did that, sort of, you know, and re released a paper on that together with sort of Bill Marchak, who, who was a member of Bahrain Watch, um, other, other people started getting in contact with me and I started following this scene more closely. In, in Morocco, a uh, citizen journalist movement named Mamfakinch, um, whose tagline was no concessions. What they did is they reported on what they believed to be draconian activities of the Moroccan government. Um, they were targeted using another commercial piece of malware. Uh, they were actually sent, be, being a journalist site, someone actually went to their contact us page, sent them a small message which said, this is really sensitive material, uh, I need to stay out of this, but you know you need to have a look at this. And it was called. It was a link to a document named scandal.doc, which happened to be a Word document containing an exploit, which then installed uh, this commercial surveillance software. And another guy targeted by the same stuff. So these are all cases that I actually ended up working. This man is named Ahmed Mansour. He's currently an advisor to Human Rights Watch in the Middle East. He's also a member of a group named the UAE Five. Um, and he was thrown in jail for signing a pro-democracy petition, not a popular uh, political stance in Abu Dhabi. Um, he was also being, he got released from jail maybe, I think he served two years or something, uh, and he, his, his political views didn't change, but unfortunately the political views of the establishment in Abu Dhabi didn't change either. Uh, so it meant as he, as he continued to give pro-democracy lectures, he found that he was being tracked physically and assaulted. Uh, and that you know, he, he would go to give these talks and then he would be physically beaten. Um, and he had no idea how this was actually happening, like how they, how they were finding him. Um, he ended up getting in touch with me subsequent to the, the, the work I'd done for Bahrain Watch. And it turned out 
that he actually also had a commercial surveillance implant installed on his machine. And they were reading his emails and using it to track his location. Um, now, the last two cases, the software was written by this group called Hacking Team, which, I mean, really, if you're going to come up with a name for your nation state, <laughs> like, I, I think actually the name came first and the product came second, because normally you do it the other way around. Like, the product is actually called Remote Control System, which is very boring and bland, right? Um, so, I mean, if, if they'd sort of applied that to naming their company, it might have worked out better for them. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to Hacking Team a little bit more later, but essentially they're an Italian company that sells what's essentially software, you know, backdoors, implants, malware, for lawful interception. I, I don't really like that word because the word itself implies that it's fine. Um, so it's got the word lawful in it. Uh, but I mean, f functionally, you know, it, it's, it's, it's governmental interception, right? Like breaking into people's computers, installing surreptitious software that hides their activities, and then you, you know, record what people are doing through their webcams, monitor ambient sound around their computers, you know, track their keystrokes, read their emails, see who they're communicating with, and that type of thing. Um, as, as part of this work, I did the first analysis together with Bill Marchak and Claudio Guarnieri of a suite of such implants for, for mobile phones, because obviously as, as the world has gone mobile, so does the surveillance state. Um, and so there's a paper I call The Smartphone Who Loved Me. It, it doesn't contain this cute picture of the Android getting wasted. Um, but, but the spyware provides all the stuff that you imagine you might want for the purposes of espionage, surveillance, or tracking, right? Um, it, it intercepts calls, um, tracks people's GPS locations, obviously allows you to read people's messages, you know, and so on and so forth. The bit that actually kind of freaked me out was the invisible microphone facility. I mean, it's actually called spy call, when, when you disassemble a code, right? Or, it, it's actually called, there's a function called spy call. And, and, and so what that does is it takes over the hardware of the phone and instantiates an outbound call um, to a remote number. And so someone just hears all the ambient audio around your phone. Um, and of course, you know, the phone's still dark and that type of thing. If there's an incoming call, what it does is it you know, returns control of the hardware to the phone processes. Uh, you know, lights go on, phone vibrates, that sort of thing. And it, and it places the outbound call on call waiting. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, you know, you, you, you know, when you finish your call, spy phone kicks in again and, you know, and start listening to you. Uh, and, of course, you know, I'm sitting there and I've, I've, I've got a decompiler open and a disassembler and stuff, and I'm looking at my phone. And it's kind of this, this sort of thing where I'm like, and I start thinking about putting it in the fridge, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, I've become one of those people. I'm like, damn it. Um, yeah, which I think speaks a lot to the relationship that we have with these devices that we carry everywhere, right? Like there's this kind of, you know, it's the first thing I look at in the morning and the last thing I look at before I go to bed. And, you know, half of Americans between the ages of 15 and 30 check Facebook on their iPhones, the first thing that they do when they wake up in the morning, right? And so you kind of have this like odd trust relationship with something that you just carry around with you all the time. Um, <laughs> as discussed in the previous talk, I'm going to show none of my working on this, but I wrote a paper for the University of Toronto, so you can look it up, and there's hashes and domains and IPs and code snippets and all that sort of thing, so you can look at it there. Um, but this... There's conferences, much like this one, where you can go and actually talk to these vendors. Um, this one is co commonly known as the Wiretapper's Ball. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's, there's one in DC. Um, you know, they have, it, they have it around the world. You can, you can go along and surveillance vendors, you know, show their wares. Uh, this is not the only brand of this conference. There are others where you can go to purchase your surveillance software together with your gold-plated Uzi. Um, you know, or, or whatever dictator finery that, you know, you, you desire. Um, around that time, you know, I, I actually started tracking, in addition to this sort of bespoke targeted surveillance, I started tracking uh, the usage of software, hardware, and solutions that provided, I guess, what you'd describe as massive intercept, mass surveillance, or also so mass censorship capability. So one of these companies... Um, they're called Blue Coat, and they're out of Sunnyvale in California. Um, and you know that they, they provide software which can be used rather benignly, right? Like it's used to prevent the viewing of pornography in libraries, say. Um, I talked to a Blue Coat salesman actually at a conference once, and I was like, 
whoa, how, how big did these scales uh, scale? And, and you know, I was like, y you, must, you must really hit some bandwidth things. And he's like, oh, no, we can do entire countries. Like, whoa, really? Like, entire countries, you say? That must be really handy. Like, oh, yeah, no, I mean, me. And, and, and of course, there's, there's sort of issues with that, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, a couple of years ago, myself and some other fellows, um, uh, Colin Anderson primarily did a bunch of scanning of the whole internet looking for these devices. And we came up with a kind of uh, a criteria, I guess, for deciding whether or not we cared about it. So, for instance, if you found it on a private network, so it's a corporate network, Right, then it's like, well, these networks belong to whoever this is assigned to, so technically, I guess they can do whatever they want with it. And also, people do sign some sort of agreement, whatever draconian it is, when they actually elect to use this network, so fine. Um, and th th those, are the, those are the gray areas. Uh, the black is we didn't find it. The blue area is when we found them on like public sort of ISP provider and government networks. Um, and so we did a bunch of this, and of course, we found it in a couple of areas that I just simply contraindicated, uh, like Syria. Um, now, that's actually just flat up illegal for a US company to sell stuff to Syria. Uh, and Blue Coat was filing $2.8 million. Um, this wasn't the first work on sort of the, the skullduggery of Blue Coat. There was a, a group uh, called Telecomics who, who had actually been. Uh, really pursuing the use of, of blue coat stuff in Syria for quite some time. Um, about a year later, we followed it up and actually found that not only in Syria, but also in Sudan and Iran was this gear being sold. Um, so, I mean, this is an American company who's sort of selling, you know, filtering, monitoring, uh, censorship and sort of surveillance apparatus to customers with human rights records that you might think are not great. Uh, I mean, that, that, that sort of part can get, actually get contentious, right? Um, in that, you know, I sort of get other people sort of respond to me like, well, the U US runs gulags, Guantanamo Bay, that sort of thing. And it's like, well, that's true, but these people aren't even complying with the law of the native land, which is that you don't actually sell to these countries. Um, we, we sort of did another report, and we, we're still not entirely sure of um, what, what's going to happen to them on account of their stuff being found in, in Iran and Sudan. Um, I kind of continued to be contacted by people who felt that they may have been victims of sort of state-sponsored aggression digitally. Uh, there was a woman in LA named Noc Tu who ran the largest political blog outside of Vietnam. And her WordPress got hacked. Uh, and, and like she got locked out of her blog. Um, and my first thought was actually, I was like, yeah, I don't know if this really looks state-sponsored. I mean, how petty can a state be? Answer is very. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> at the time, I couldn't really figure it out. Um, you know, she'd actually done a lot of rest sort of restorative work, had people help her trying to get her blog back and stuff, and the, the trail was greasy and kind of cold. Um, but, you know, I, I sort of did what I could, and I, and I kept the data. A and then, you know, I, I ended up sort of talking to, you know, more and more people about sort of the Vietnamese government's you know, surveillance practices. And I encountered more and more people who, who felt that they'd been victimized by this. Um, and this actually finally blew up when uh, there's a guy named Chris Brummett, who is actually the author of this article. Uh, he is a journalist who writes for Associated Press, who is stationed on the ground in Hanoi. And he received a document which promised to be uh, a breakdown of the human rights practices of Vietnam, ironically. Like, it just. <laughs> um, and this actually proved to be sort of targeted malware designed to compromise his system that was actually of the same kind that was found um, on the system of the woman who, who ran the, the Basan blog out of LA. Um, this <laughs> was the same as malware that had been used to target a Vietnamese constitutional law professor in Toulouse who wrote extensively about proposed changes of um, rule of law for Vietnam, and there's sort of other people around the world that have been targeted by exactly the same people. And what we ended up seeing was kind of a pattern of basically every politically active Vietnamese group that you can imagine had actually been targeted by the same people. Um, I got very interested in actually the targeting of what, what I mean, even intelligence people might describe as sort of non-legitimate targets, right? Like non-combatants, not, not, not military or government installations, not large corporates, but actually individuals. 
right? You know, activists, journalists, and that type of thing. And, and this was actually the last piece of work that I did publicly before I left Google, um, which was a study which actually ended up showing that I think 21 out of 25 of the world's top news organizations had been targeted by state-sponsored attackers. Um, I then moved to working for First Look Media, um, where I released some work on the targeted malware used by the Five Eyes, um, or the UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the US. Um, they had, had used this to compromise the European Parliament. Um, if, for those of you with long memories, they, they hacked a telecommunications provider in Belgium called Belgicom. Um, and so this was actually a sample that was found um, on this host in the Belgicom network, um, which is kind of an implant that it had, had been written by the Five Eyes. So, so by hacking Belgicom, this allowed them access to the communications of all sorts of interesting targets upstream, which sort of also included European Parliament. Um, after that, I worked on... Baba was actually amusingly what we ended up calling the French government's targeted espionage kit. Uh, that, this linked to a whole bunch of other stuff, which was found in Iran and Syria. Um, recently at Black Hat, uh, together with Marion Marchilek, I released something on, uh, I guess, a suite. Right? I guess, I guess you know, in, in this case, it's kind of almost like archaeology, because this goes back to... 2002, and so I don't know how many of you guys remember like the new executable format, like 16-bit windows and stuff. This malware targeted those systems, right? This is why I said it's sort of you know it's kind of archaeology, and then this looks like it was Israel. Um, most recently, I've been actually working on the case of Alberto Nisman, who some of you might know because this was kind of like a South American JFK sort of thing. He was a lawyer, and he was just about to indict. The, pri the president of Argentina, and then he was found mysteriously dead in his apartment three days before that, uh, apparently of suicide, although there were no powder, from suicide by gunshot to the head, no powder burns on his hands. It, everything looks very suspicious, and as it turns out, there was malware on his phone. Um, so I ended up looking into this and found that this actually tracked to a whole campaign of spying in Latin America, um, including against other high-profile you know, uh, uh, investigative journalists such as Jorge Lanata, um, and, and, and allegedly, although I was unable to prove this, uh, ended up targeting the president's son as well, Maxima Kirchner. So, <laughs> I've had an interesting time doing this type of work over the last few years. Uh, this guy is the PR flack for Hacking Team, who is one of the uh, companies I mentioned before that writes sort of commercial, commercial tools for espionage. He doesn't like me very much. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things he sort of said to a reporter was he was kind of like, hey, you know, one person's activist is another person's terrorist. You know, sort of basically a sort of everyone's a legitimate target kind of argument. Um, then they actually wrote and they sent this to my bosses um, where they said, called me a tireless wolf crier on the issue of privacy as I saw it. And then I think they argued that I was helping pedophiles and criminals and terrorists and that type of thing with my work. Um, which you know, seemed a little bit harsh. Um, now, <laughs> yeah, see, that laugh is exactly what I did when hacking team themselves was hacked earlier this year, and their email spool got dumped. Um, <laughs> and inside this email spool, you know, because you know, in, in this kind of age of self-googling, um, so I looked myself up. And I'm, I'm sure it's not personal, but I was mentioned 117 times in their email archive. My, my Twitter pseudonym, which uh, was Morgan Mayhem for a number of years, was mentioned 29 times. And I'm, I'm at Headhunter on Twitter, uh, which, which got 15 mentions, which clearly I'm not big enough on Twitter. But um, <laughs> I mean, what, <laughs> where things got even weirder was that they actually took photographs of me and recorded me. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is me giving a, a talk, actually, not dissimilar to this one. In fact, it, it does use some of the same material, that, that talk that I gave. And this is photos that they took of me. Um, this was actually found in the home directory of one of the hacking team guys. And I got this mail from someone who was like, hey, have you looked for yourself in the hacking team dump? And I was like, yeah, you know, I found this stuff. And they're like, did you see this stuff where they surveilled you? And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> which I have to admit came as a little surprise to me, but that is actually not the weirdest thing that came out of this work. This is the weirdest thing, and that's why I said before, like, none of you guys get any weird ideas, because <laughs> we had a meeting with Eduardo. This went very well, and they were impressed. Right, so they used code names. So meeting today with a group from Phoebe. So if we go mnemonically, like F-B-I, oh, so <laughs> who could Phoebe be? Um, also, in some ways, their OPSEC is not great, because you see here, FBI quietly forms secret of net surveillance unit, and they've got the link in, in their email. So it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really matter that they're using this code name. But so Phoebe, whoever that might be, um, you know, they, they, they met with, and it turns out that this meeting was because of a piece that I wrote. I wrote a piece called Police Story about hacking teams' mobile implants. Um, and they say, if anything good came out of the Citizen Lab articles, it's that it brought them to contact us to see if it was true. It was more than they expected. Thank you, Citizen Lab. And I was kind of like, what? <laughs> like, really? Like, am I just doing free QA for these people? All right? Like, you know, you reverse this software, you look at it, and you're like, oh, you know, their obfuscation method is kind of cool here, and they use this kernel driver here to, like, hide processes. And it's like, really? Oh, yeah. Anyway, um, so the FBI looks at it, and it's like, huh independently verifies their promotional materials, that's cool. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, anyway, this stuff is kind of grim, so I like to just stick kittens randomly in my slides. Um, but anyway, I mean, the, the thing is that, the, <laughs> you know, this, I mean, in, in some ways, the, it's, it's an interesting crowd here because you have a lot of very skilled software developers, and there's a lot of very skilled software developers that are actually writing this type of software. Um, and this, this market is only increasing, right? And, and, and it, it's, we've seen kind of, as, as sort of public awareness of this has, has risen, uh, we've seen a, a comparable spate of, of sort of basically generally communication privacy tools. Um, you know, stuff like Silent Circle, uh, Whisper Systems is actually really good. If you don't have Signal installed on your iPhone or Tech Secure on your Android, you should just install it while I'm talking and space out for a second. Um, you know, most of you probably have heard of Tor, um, which kind of provides an anonymization overlay network for your traffic. Um, but this is actually very confusing to generally the lay person or even the not particularly security interested technical person because you don't really know what you're trying to protect yourself against or what type of, I mean, it's not, this, you know, what's a methodical way of thinking about these threats? All that we know is, is that there's powerful people that want to do bad things and, you know, software developers that are doing stuff that I might not do and making a lot of money doing it. Um, so I thought that what I'd do actually is I'd kind of discuss sort of threat modeling um, for, for these types of attackers. So sort of, you know, this is, this is, this is a very scientific taxonomy of threat that I came up with uh, on a bar napkin one time. Um, and I will now present it to you in slide form. So most of you guys have probably have heard of Alice and Bob and Eve, right? You guys, hands, everyone, Alice and Bob? Yeah, great. So anyone who's like done five minutes of reading about cryptography learns about this, right? And, and, and this is, you know, so Alice wants to have a conversation with Bob sends an email to via their happy mail account. Um, and then, you know, they have even they might even have a an HTTPS login to this happy mail service. Um, and then the email gets sent clear text across the internet and Eve is the malicious eavesdropper. Now for the purposes of this argument, let's assume that the cost of Eve is zero. Now, Eve costs a lot of money to uh, instantiate, to set up. set up costs for Eve might be billions of dollars, right? Because Eve is Fiber taps and internet exchanges, Eva's, um, you know, rooms in AT and T, um, Eva's alligator clips on wires. If you've seen the life of others, Eva's the, um, you know, state agent listening to listening to and doggedly transcribing phone calls. But we assume that Eva's omnipresent, and the cost of listening to you using Eva is very low. Um, sometimes Eve is done at scale. Uh, I, I was working at Google when this happened. Um, this was the, the, um, the GCHQ was actually harvesting Google's data, um, and that while it was kind of encrypted 
uh, between customer and Google. It wasn't encrypted inside the data centers. And so what they'd done is they started tapping Google's leased lines, and they had this very hilarious slide where they had an SSL added and removed here. Um, if you worked at Google at the time like I did, it kind of felt a little bit like this. Um, I thought they probably didn't really understand the kind of Hodor Akbar RPC very well. Um, but, you know, they didn't really need to. So the cost of EVE is zero. Um, but EVE is actually pretty, I mean, it's cheap for them. EVE is pretty easy to defeat. If you're installing Signal on your phone or you have, then you're already defeating EVE, right? You, you can kind of, you can defeat EVE through the use of basic encryption software. Uh, EVE has a pricier, meaner <laughs> older sister that we're going to call Mallory. Um, now, Mallory is your malicious active attacker. Uh, this diagram was drawn for me by Willow Blue, um, and, and it actually uh, documents a real-life scenario for an active attacker. So Hacking Team actually created this platform, which they called a network injector, which is basically a mechanism for performing man-in-the-middle attacks at scale, which you can do if you own the wires. And so what it is is it's a rack that you slap into a data center. It plugs into a radio server. So you just look up someone's name. It tells you their IP address st straight away. You isolate their traffic stream, look for like an, an HTTP download of a binary or something like that, and then you just change it. <laughs> Um, and so you just sort of melt that binary together with your implant, uh, make sure it doesn't mess with the icon, um, and then you know when someone runs it on download, it'll you know stick the implant into memory, uh, change the binary on disk so it's simply the original, and then it'll run the original and you'll get your installer or whatever. Um, another way that they were actually doing it, because I mean waiting for people to download software might be a drag. So they would actually inject things into traffic streams. And one of the things that they would do is they would inject stuff into YouTube screens. Uh, because while YouTube, the login, like the, the actual screen looked like it was HTTPS, the videos were still played in clear text. So what they would do is, you know, this person watching videos, here is your bank of cats at the other end. Um, and, and, and the malicious attacker would, would wait for the clear text stream, and then it would tell someone that they needed to update their fat Flash player, which, like, absolutely every suggestion to update your Flash player on the internet is malicious. Um, and so, I mean, Google actually fixed this. Um, I mean, it was kind of one of those things that's sort of like a generally known vulnerability in the state of the internet, right? Like, this is just sort of a problem with how we decided to do transport in the beginning. Um, but of course, if you're running a large service and you discover that people are actively exploiting this to attack your users, you kind of have to fix it. And Google actually did. Um, now, I mean, th this, is, this is sort of you know, just an example of what a user gets, right? You get the bogus flash player. Now, how much does this sort of rig cost? Well, that's, um, there we go, 874,000 Swiss francs. So let's call it around US $1 million. Um, and that, that's generally how, I mean, obviously you need a piece of paper which says, which allows you to go to an internet service provider and actually install it. So, I mean, if I bought this million dollars, then I'm not sure what I would do with this rack. Um, you know, I would inject the hell out of people that use my guest wireless. Uh, <laughs> um, but so, I mean, targeted teams are also, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on Chinese government hacking. This is also Mallory. Um, this is actually a slide in from an NSA presentation, which I thought this was a little bit underhanded. It turned out that the NSA was hoovering up information on Microsoft crashes. Um, so this is their joke, right? This actually looks like a Microsoft crash error report, but I mean, this was actually, it, this, was the, this slide was made by the NSA themselves. And it says, this information may be in intercepted by a foreign SIGINT system to gather detailed information and better exploit your machine. Uh, <laughs> No, without a sense of humor. Um, so Mallory actually costs something, right? Because someone's got to write the exploit, someone's got to write the software. Um, it's frequently a team of people, this stuff is written over time. If you're doing this professionally, you actually care a lot about the stability of your code, right? Like implants generally hook in a very low level in the operating system. You need to not be crashing and blue screening stuff all the time, right? Like, 
you know, if, 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 people, <laughs> if people start getting, you know, core dumps and blue screens and that sort of thing, then this isn't very good. And in fact, as I said before, if a target is interesting, it's likely to be targeted by more than one people. So maybe you want your backdoor to be so stable that it has to operate with the kernel code of the Russians at the same time that's also been maliciously inserted into the running kernel of this machine. So this is actually a really difficult problem when you think about it. So you have, some, you have a team of exceptionally skilled low-level engineers. Um, now, so I mean, this costs money, right? And you know, in a lot of places, this also costs legal approvals. You know, like, I mean, there's lawyers who, I mean, there's Pfizer courts, um, you know, all that sort of thing. Like, hey, I want to hack this person slash company slash thing. Like, all right, let's have a look. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. You know, why? Oh, you know, intelligence sounds great. Like, free Netflix? No, you know. Um, and so, 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 I mean, it costs some money. Now, if for some reason Mallory doesn't work, and, and, and Mallory is actually pretty effective in this day and age, Mallory is cheaper than human intelligence, right, and a lot more deniable. Um, but then you, you actually meet this, um, and then not George Clooney or Brad Pitt, but basically what I mean is, is kind of like a, an ops team, right, someone that's going to gain physical access and steal things. Uh, it, it might look more like this, um, but, but I mean, you know, th this, is, this is very effective, right, if you want to get intelligence, right, you know, like people, you know, cut through glass, and I'm actually not an expert on this end of things, um, but, but it, it, it's... It's sort of the, the, the human, the physical operation. Um, now, this, this costs money, because it's people. To have people highly trained enough to do this well and reliably, obviously, costs a lot of money to train them. There's not necessarily, they're a finite resource. Um, and this takes, there's, you know, there's a military chain of command or, or whatever, right? And these people expect to be paid, and they don't scale. Um, but basically, when people talk about raising the cost of surveillance, which comes up a lot in the sort of modern narrative, right, what you want to do is you want to turn Eve into Mallory and turn Mallory into a burglar. Uh, now, I didn't say this. A, a reasonably smart friend of mine did. Um, and I ended up thinking, I was like, well, sure. I mean, the burglar is kind of expensive, well, the, the special ops team and that type of thing. But there's actually someone that comes after this. And it's Jack Bauer. Now, I don't, I'm not actually, I've never actually watched 24, uh, but, but Jack Bauer seems like a really unpleasant guy from what I can glean. Like, as far as I know, he basically just tortures people for like five seasons. Like, he just you know, ties people to chairs and just slaps them repeatedly. Uh, you know, so, so, so Jack Bauer is kind of my byline for, for a torture or someone, I mean, I, I guess the, uh, the industry term for this is, is, is rubber hose cryptography, right? Um, you know, you, you extract key materials or other sensitive information from someone through use of rubber hose. Um, and this is very expensive. Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's very expensive because you're not really supposed to do it. Um, I mean, in order to do this institutionally, you need a black site, maybe something in Abu Ghraib, perhaps. Um, also, <laughs> if you're found out doing this, it costs you political cachet, which is more than money, because it means that the president of a country has to stand up on television and say, yeah, we tortured some folks, you know, we're really sorry, um, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's something that politicians really don't like doing. Um, but this is kind of a useful scale to think about when we actually talk about in terms of surveillance. It's, it's a kind of, um, <laughs> I mean, if we want to talk about a cost-benefit analysis, right? Um, but these are, these, are the, these are the sort of the types of actors. And now let's actually talk about like the, the, the players in the real world that we get, right? Um, and so this is the GCHQ. I chose to use this humorous picture that Banksy drew outside of a phone booth in Cheltenham. This is the, the UK Secret Service. Uh, everyone knows who the National Security Agency is. Uh, this, is the this is the illustration the EFF uses, the eagle with the, holding the phone lines of the world in its talons. Um, but functionally, th these are the high-end attackers, right? So we've got... Uh, US, UK, the Five Eyes, um, Israel, China, France, and so forth. Uh, a friend of mine once described, you know, this com commonly, you know, when we talk about APT, which is Advanced Persistent Threat, right, the joke he made was, was it? Um, advanced Russia, Persistent China, Threat Israel. Um, so, I mean, there's kind of a lot of sort of discussion of this type of thing in the security scene. Um, and, and this is, you know, th these people, they... 
you know, they make artisanal, small batch, locally made, homegrown malware. Because you've got, you've got a lot of developers, right? I mean, you can, you can have a team of 30, 40 people writing this stuff over 10 years. Um, and then you can have a team of 100 operators. And I mean, like, you know, this, the, there is a lot of resource. There's a lot of universities. There's a lot of skilled developers. There's a lot of money. Um, then you've sort of got this, this, this next tier of countries. Um, and what they do is they buy stuff like hacking team software, or like FinFisher. Um, and they don't necessarily have the depth to do the, the homegrown bespoke, because again, remember you know, what I talked about, low-level developers, crashing code, all that type of thing. Like, you actually do need expertise for this. Um, and so there's a commercial market. And, and, and these vendors, they sell to law enforcement, to intelligence agencies. And they kind of probably shouldn't, but sometimes they sell to third-party security companies. Um, and this is the tier of actors that I'd sort of describe as the pay-for-tools tier. Um, and then you get this, again, down another tier. You kind of get cyber mercenaries. And so we, we actually have seen like, a, a rise of, of this type of thing over the last few years. Like, I'm not sure if you guys remembered a few years ago, there was actually someone online offering root at mysql.com for $5,000. Um, <laughs> like, just on some forum. I was like, wait, what? Um, but there's companies, uh, one of which is known as Appen. Uh, they're out of India. Uh, Leo Impact is another one. And basically, these guys will do sort of bespoke jobs for you. Um, and so they, they, they sort of position themselves as investigators in the form of ethical hackers. Uh, and, and so, you know, like they'll, they'll, they'll break into opposing legal counsel during court cases and steal their data and let you know what they're doing and, and all of this type of thing. And they're for countries that really don't have this type of dedicated program, uh, but, you know, it's worth paying these people for one-off jobs. Um, and then, of course, there's cybercrime. Uh, sometimes these people are very good. They're definitely institutional and organized. There is more money in ad fraud than there is in just about anything else in the world right now. Um, and this is the kind of the got to get paid contention, right? Like, so I mean, they're not really interested in particular targets. They're just interested in overall the amount of money that they make. Um, and so all of this actually, the equation for all of these people is the same, right? Which is the attacker resources versus of cost versus how much a target actually is worth to you. Uh, and then there's, of course, the one type of attacker, which I haven't mentioned yet, um, which is the, the black hat, the hacktivist, the personally motivated. Um, and I don't... <laughs> it, it's difficult playing these types of attackers because it's not necessarily sort of... The, the, the logic doesn't really exist there in the same way. So with the other ones, if there's a, like, cost is too high to acquire this target, we're going to ditch. With this one, you know, never underestimate someone who is cash poor but time rich. Um, and you know, when will they stop? We don't know. This person might be pissed forever. Um, but for, for all reasonable sort of attackers, um, you know, what I call methodical or professional or whatever, um, there's a kind of like, you know, this business stock diagram that I have used here. Um, you know, efficiency, quality, cost, it's, it's the same, same type of thing you know, when you're making standard business decisions. And they probably have meetings that work in exactly the same way. You know? There's a project manager, and it's like, okay, list of targets this week, percentage of acquisition, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and and you know, s spying now means that you sit in an office with multicolored bean bags, and you have like M&M things, and you know, smoothies, and massages, and haircuts on site. Um, but yeah. So, I mean, there's these kind of blended threat, threat categories. This isn't discrete. Um, as I said, for instance, you know, there's, you know, I said human was more expensive. But, I mean, in some cases, you know, what is this? Is this a replenishing the minibar, or is this an evil maid attack on your hotel room? You know, you're like, oh, you know, we, we don't know. Uh, th this was actually my hotel room. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, also, it's not a discrete category of enemies, right? Um, because in some cases, for instance, say I'm protecting my journalists who are writing a story about national security. FBI probably wouldn't like them to know what I'm doing. However, Charlie Hebdo-style attacks, where terrorists just kill eight journalists with machine guns in, in their offices. FBI, all of a sudden, very good friend. Um, so, you know, as I said, like, this, is, this is actually sort of a continuous scale. Uh, but the concerns are the same for both sides. Right? So CNE, which is, you know, uh, institutional actors call hacking, computer network exploitation. Um, it's cheaper than insider threat or human intelligence and that type of thing. 
Um, it's all about sort of leveraging what you can control, as I said, you know, these sort of network injectors and internet exchanges and so forth. Um, and you know, for, for, for both attackers and defenders, you know, like if you're, if you're running a company and you have customer data or you know, anything like that, like what's the most cost-effective way to uh, compromising, com either compromising that data or protecting that data? Um, you know, just like we talked about before, or, or, or I didn't talk about, but in the earlier talk, right, like, you know, complexity and cost isn't always negative if it's protecting data, but then, you, of course, you probably want to balance this with what you get out of it. Um, so we have this one-size-does-not-fit-all problem. Um, and <laughs> this means that I've, I've spent a lot of time dealing with people that have asked me questions about this type of thing. Uh, so, so that's the, kind of the end of the ta ta taxonomy thing, and this is, this is the kind of the human problem here. Um, so, you know, people are like, well, what can I do to protect myself? And I'm like, well, against what? And what are you trying to protect? And this is sort of like, how can I tell if I'm compromised? And I'm like, well, you know, again, <laughs> by whom? And what do you think is compromised? And then, then I just sort of get this like, hey, I'd really like you to look at my random device because I'm a kind of politically interested person. I think that I'm really important um, and, and probably a target of nation state surveillance. Um, and, you know, like, after spending a while sort of trying to answer these questions really earnestly, um, I discovered that what a lot of people actually really wanted to hear was, oh, there's this app called Morgan's Total Security that works for your iPhone. You just install it, and everything is sweet. Because um, what they don't, I mean, they don't want to hear is like, like, hmm, how do you really protect yourself? And it's like, well you should probably hire a top flight security team, give them invasive access to all of your data and communications so they can monitor everything you do in real life. Um, because if you had a physical threat, that's what you'd do. You'd hire a bunch of burly ex-special forces people to stand around in your house, right? And they'd just you know, stand there and look tough. And, and they'd sort of act as a deterrent, and they'd also like, shoot people if they got close. But it's really invasive and kind of annoying, right? Um, so, <laughs> so the, I mean, same problem. Uh, but, but, th but this is what people actually want, right? Um, which kind of makes me a little um, uncharitable, shall we say. Um, and as I said, you know, security engineer, actually not that great with humans. Um, spent a lot of time trying to get better, but you know, it's a learning curve. Um, but, but, you know, the more charitable side of me actually thinks, well, like, look, this is complicated, right? A and so we hit the whole, like, sufficiently complicated stuff is indistinguishable from magic, which is fair, okay. Um, so, the analogy that I actually ended up using with people frequently, like sort of how can we deal with this, is like, well, you know, you, you know what, what happens if you think that you have some sort of bizarre disease, right? Like you go to a doctor and say, Doc, I think I have, you know, whooping chills or something. Um, and, you know, the, the doctor says like, well, why do you think this? He's symptomatic. And you say, no. And he's like, hmm, well, have you been anywhere strange recently? Like, well, no. Like, yeah, you're probably fine then. Like, well, I don't, I don't feel fine. Like, I have money. I would like you to do a battery of invasive tests on me. Like, well, okay. okay. And so they take a lot of your blood and your urine and your spit and I don't know, a piece of your arm or something. And then, and then this gets sent off to a lab where a really educated lab tech will take a long time using expensive tools to look at this stuff and then send back these results. And you'll never actually meet this lab tech, right? Um, and the results take an indeterminate amount of time to happen. Um, and then you can't really read them when they show up. And then the doctor tells you that you're fine. Um, and I mean, this, this is actually kind of what, what actually happens. Uh, uh, but, but I mean, this is, this is an analogy that people actually understand when they come up to me and say, like, hey, how do I figure out if my computer is compromised? And I'm like, well. You know, I'd probably take an image of your memory, and then, you know, I'd look for hooking of processes or process injection. Um, I'd try to see if, you know, allocation tables have been modified in some way, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Which, of course, again, you know, actually, people want the app. Um, they don't want to hear a discussion about how the lab tests happen. Um, now, yeah, so... <laughs> I mean, I've spent a while thinking about this problem, and you know, I, I, don't, I don't actually know about this assertion. That may not be true, uh, because that's not what I'm expert at, but, but, but I'm going to assume that we can't design better humans right now, um, or humans that are more resilient to surveillance, or, or any of this type of things. What I think we, and by we I mean this crowd, 
um, can do is design more resilient systems to, to this type of problem. Um, and I say this crowd because the security community is traditionally really great at designing unusable systems, which is what we've been doing for years. Uh, like, I mean, there are actually some like, really secure systems. It's just nobody uses them. Um, and so it I sort of goes back to what I was talking about before, which is coercion-resistant design, right? And so the, the axiom that I sort of produce here, and like, I mean, when I first started thinking about this, I sounded like one of the paranoid people that puts their phone in the fridge. Um, but, you know, I think, I think, you know, sort of general understanding of this landscape is better these days. And I've, I mean, I've spent the last 18 months, if you remember what my actual day job is, um, working on systems for handling sensitive data, storing it, transporting it, and, and sort of dealing with its you know, daily engagement. And so I've been thinking about coercion-resistant design again a lot. And, you know, it is possibly obvious to some of you why this applies to my day job, but you might be thinking, like, well, <laughs> why does this apply to any of you? Well, so my, my assertion, actually, is that as your service, app, website, or whatever, um, increases in popularity, the likelihood that you will eventually be forced to coerce your security model becomes definite, right? And, and I say this because, you know, you, you, you're creating the new WhatsApp. You're creating Netflix. You're creating Fastly or Wikipedia or, or anything like this, right? All of that data is appealing, literally all of it. I want to be able to see what Wikipedia articles people are reading. I want to be able to see what movies people are watching. You know, I definitely want to be able to see what people are messaging each other, because, I mean, I have no idea how many drug deals are conducted on WhatsApp, but there's probably a lot. Um, and, and we've kind of gotten to the point in society where legal coercion no longer actually takes the point of simply asking services for data. And, I mean, as, as most of you will be aware, there's actually, like, a really large political issue about this right now. Um, so, I mean, there's actually been a lot of legal demands to, like, alter systems and, and provide key materials and that sort of thing. For, for a lot of really large players. And I mean, this goes back a long way, actually. Like, this, this hasn't happened in a vacuum. Of course, there's sort of like the first crypto wars, um, which again goes back to the kind of like cypherpunk thing in, in New Zealand when I was there. And, you know, like I sort of saw this happen, and it was like, oh, if you actually try to build security into things, then institutional powers will actually want you to coerce these systems, which is when I first started thinking about this. But I mean, if, if we, you know, and then we won the first crypto wars. Huzzah! Um, Microsoft, right, when they first launched disk encryption, the head of BitLocker Engineering said he was asked multiple times by the FBI to install key escrow so they could read it. Um, LavaBit was Edward Snowden's email provider. I mean, he got an order for the secret keys, which would allow them to look at the email for all of their customers, not just Snowden's email. Uh, Skype is a really interesting one, because initially the way they designed it, they said, look, there's, <laughs> Skype was this encrypted peer-to-peer -peer protocol, and they were like, we wouldn't know how to tap this if we tried. Uh, there was an internal uh, NSA project called Project Chess, basically to force Skype to be redesigned um, in order to make it tappable, uh, of which, of course, since it's been bought by Microsoft, it is actually now very much so, uh, because all of the actual servers that control it, it's no longer truly peer-to-peer, -peer, so all the communication goes through Microsoft servers. Um, any data is interesting. <laughs> I, I loved this one, World of Spycraft. So the NSA and CIA spied in online games. The GCHQ, which is you know, Britain's NSA, has a vigorous effort to exploit game and virtual environments and produced exploitation modules in Xbox Live and World of Warcraft. Like, if you have users and your service is popular, then you have data that is interesting to people. Now, I mean, I'm focusing a lot on the state here because there's... Um, I mean, there's sort of documentation and history around this. However, you know, when I talk about coercion, I actually talk about anyone that's likely to coerce this data out of you, right? Like, the state has a monopoly on kind of legitimate coercion of enterprise, but there's a lot of people that don't really care about legitimacy, you know, sort of organized crime and so on and so forth, right? That will also be interested in getting, you know, data that's pertinent to them out of, out of people. Um, and as I mentioned, for instance, at the moment, the FBI is in a big fight with Google, Apple, and basically anyone else that, in their view that actually is trying to provide robust privacy protections to their customers. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the legal aspects of this actually become very interesting. Because uh, <laughs> while the FBI thinks they sort of, you know, represent the interests of government, that's not entirely true, because, for instance, there's certain standards bodies that are like, um, 
we're the government too, and we think this is a really terrible idea. Like, we really don't want to force people to engineer deliberately insecure systems. Um, but I think, you know, it actually kind of shows that the, the, the basic assertion actually sort of remains true. Um, and while, you know, I've been kind of aware of, while I'm sort of doing this rant that I might sound like a crazy person, because I'm like, oh my god, you should really engineer systems in a way which assume governmental coercion, et cetera, et cetera. We actually have been building systems that we think are important like this for some time. So for instance, the DNS redesign that is DNSSEC, currently the way it works is that a minimum of five of the world's seven key holders uh, from these different countries would actually have to converge in the US um, in order to subvert the system. I mean, that's a whole bunch of people from a whole bunch of different countries, and that's because we decided that DNS was really core and really important. Um, however, this was kind of in an age when the only things that were really core and really important was the network, right? And all the services that happened on it were kind of like, eh, I mean, people do stuff and there's users, but we don't really care. Um, but I actually think that that's everything now. Um, and, 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 you know, as it's been pointed out throughout this conference, and, and Alex said before, you know, we're kind of starting to run the world now. <laughs> so as everything moves online, I think it's actually more and more important that we design systems with the duty to our users in mind. And I'd like to finish. Um, oh, so, as I mentioned, I don't, I don't think this is actually that different from the way a lot of people think right now. I mean, it's kind of like designing for failure, only with a little more dystopian future, you know? You guys have read cyberpunk novels. Um, I'd like to actually finish, though, um, by returning to that analogy, right? Like, I mean, currently, I think the way security is applied across the discipline is actually a lot like Western medicine, right? Like, if you think that there's something wrong, you consult security people. Maybe you ask them to review things. Maybe you actually ask them sort of in a response capacity and so forth. Um, and, you know, this, <laughs> this works great financially for my industry. Um, but I think sort of less well for sort of security system design. Um, and I mean, a sort of, um, I mean, and we, there are interesting sort of forays into more holistic approaches, some of which have been talked about in this conference, like Rust and LangSec and stuff like this, secure parsing. Um, but I think it will actually come from the people that are actually designing systems and creating them, rather than the people that are auditing systems. Um, there was a keynote speaker who didn't get to be here, uh, Kathy Sierra, and she also wasn't at the EFF Pioneer Awards on Thursday night where I was, but she, she sent us this nice note, and this is what I'd like to leave you with, which is, no outside help is coming. We are all we've got, and thanks to all of you in this room, I am hopeful. So thank you. That's me.